Hey, welcome to the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This is brought to you by Cornwell Tools. They're the choice of professionals since 1919. Can you believe that? 1919. It's over 100 years building tools. All right, let's get rolling. (laughs) You know, we were talking the other day and we were just going through some of the experiences that have happened over the years and I started talking about the day I spent with Mario Andretti. A lot of people hadn't heard that story so we decided to share that with you. But it's not just spending the day with Mario Andretti. There's a whole backstory that goes to it. Let me just kind of fill you in on my day with Mario Andretti. This was about 2005. He had come in to to do some stuff with us. This was when I was still doing the truck show. So anyway, A little backstory on it. We had done a build-up truck with one of the magazines. And basically, it was a GMC Sierra that the magazine had done a lowering kit on and somebody else had done some other things on. So when it came to me, I might have put a supercharger on it or done a little bit under the hood. But there was nothing radical, really, about this truck. But what we were going to do, Mario was going to come in town and we were going to spend the day out at the racetrack with him. And this was the super speedway there in Nashville. And it was fairly new at the time. So Mario was going to come out and he was going to shoot some stuff with car and driver and one of their Mustangs. And then he and I were going to spend some time going around the track in the truck. Well, usually it's something that I have built. So I'm very familiar with it and make sure that it's all ready to go. (laughs) You hear the story coming here. I did not have time to do that. The truck had come in, you know, like the day before. You know, I had seen what had been done to it, but I didn't have a chance to look everything over. And why would you? I mean, supposedly it was put together right by the people that had done the work. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so anyway, we're getting out there. We did our thing that we were going to do on the show. And then the following day, you know, I drive the truck out to the super speedway. Now I'm driving down the road. The truck seems to be driving well. It's got a nice stance, wheels and tires and, and all the right stuff. And I get out there. I, I kid you not. I'm probably a half a mile from the racetrack and I pull over, you know, to get you know, at a quick stop or something to get some drinks or chips or whatever. As I get ready to get back on the road, I'm sitting at a stop sign. I'm like, you know, I, I probably ought to lay into this truck a little bit and just see, you know, what what I've got here, you know, is what it's capable of. So I just jump it off the line. I mean, I don't even rev it up or anything. I just, you know, I hit the throttle and take off. It goes all kinds of crazy and the rear end shudders and does weird stuff and the truck dies. And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, what just happened. Whatever happened didn't sound good. But I'm like, man, Mario was supposed to show up in about an hour. And I'm like, I have got to get over to the racetrack and see what's going on. So I managed to get the thing started. It fires right back up and I put it in gear and it's just thumping and whining in the back like crazy. So I limp it over to the racetrack and pull it into one of the garages there. And I said, guys, we got a problem. And the camera crew is there, you know, they've all shown up and they're like, what's up? And it's like, I don't know, but I've broken something in the back of this thing and it's bad. So <laughs> we roll it in there into one of the shops. Of course, none of the crews are there. And I think they have a little bus box welder and just some basic hand tools floor jacks and those kind of things so basically i roll it in there and i jack it up real quick and i crawl underneath it and here's what i find the pinion of the rear end is standing almost vertical it's probably about a two o'clock and how it didn't pull the drive shaft out of the transmission i don't know but the whole rear end has rotated up and i'm like what the heck Okay, so basically the stock suspension in this truck was what we call a spring over, which means the spring is over the top of the axle. There's a a little perch that is welded to the axle, and then the spring sits down on top of that, and, you know, you you hold it on with U-bolts. Most of you guys know what I'm talking about. The way that these guys have lowered it is that they had converted it to a spring under and put the axle on top of the leaf springs. You know, this gives you about three to four inches of drop. You don't have to weld anything. Now the spring perch that is welded to the axle is now up on top. And so this particular kit came with a bracket that went underneath and it had two pieces of metal that went up and mounted to the bottom of the spring perch and it was all able to be bolted in. Now theoretically this all works well. The problem is from the factory a lot of those spring perches are not welded the whole area. In other words the spring perch on the bottom is kind of a half circle shape and that whole thing 
thing needs to have a weld bead on it. Well, from the factory, a lot of times they don't put a full weld bead all the way out to the edges because the weight is down on top of that spring perch. So it's not really necessary. And there's, you know, the pressure is going down into the, the gusset that's there. Well, to do it the other direction puts all the force right in the tips of that spring perch. And this one was not welded there. So what had happened is that spring perch had broken and rotated up. So I'm looking at that going, okay, first thing we need to do is pop the U-bolts and rotate the axle back into position. So that's what we did. And we rotated it down. I took a sledgehammer that the guy had and I banged the spring perch back down where it had eared up on the front. So I got the rear end back in alignment and it got the, the pinion pointing back at the transmission like it should. But now I need to weld it. You know, and I not only need to weld where it cracked, but I also need to weld those tips or it's just going to do it again as soon as you get on the gas. Keep in mind, I don't even think I had a welding mask there. So I'm literally, you know, just putting my hand over my eyes and running a bead down the front of that thing and welding it back together, all looking at my watch because Mario's supposed to show up at any time. So I get it together and I'm looking up in there and I've gotten the beads you know, as good as I can get them doing that sort of technique. So I got the, the truck back together, but I know it's like, I don't dare really hammer into this thing because I don't know how strong those welds are because I couldn't even get up in there to see. So anyway, so I roll out from it. I'm covered in sweat, you know, been up underneath this thing, dirty shirts, all messed up now. And Mario shows up and to ride. So he's, he's riding with the guys at car and driver first as we're finishing up this truck, trying to get everything done. So literally about 20 minutes before I'm ready to ride with Mario, the truck is done. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and he's looking at me like, gosh, you're all sweaty and dirty and nasty. It's like, think you would have cleaned yourself up for this. I'm like, no, it's a truck show. Trust me. And all the time I'm thinking, okay, we do not launch this thing hard off the line. We get out and we drive it. So then we get out on the track and I start to relax a little bit, knowing that at least the rear end's not going to fall out from under this thing. And I'm making a mental note to make sure that I tell the companies that offer these kind of kits that they put in their instructions that you need to make sure that those spring perchers are welded properly from the factory. If they're not, you need to go in before you bolt this thing together and do the welding on those uh, rear ends. Because right out on the tips is where where they get dangerous. You know, you're just putting something in a situation that it wasn't designed for. So now I'm out there and I'm like, it's a nice spring day and I'm going around the track with Mario Andretti. He's got the thing to the floor and I'm like, okay, this isn't my truck. I didn't build it, you know, so I'm not on the hook here. And so I just finally allow myself to relax and enjoy Mario. He was great. You know, it was really fun to spend time with. And this was just a few months after he had he had thought about going back into racing, and that's when he had that famous wreck where he's just teacup in that car. And he fortunately walked away from it. So we had a chance to laugh about that a little bit. <laughs> he was like, yeah. He said, I thought I wanted to get back into racing. But after that, he said, you know, I've, I've done my share. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to be on the sidelines a little bit. But as I'm riding with him, I've had the opportunity to to spend a lot of time with a lot of these legendary drivers. You know, it's really cool to watch their driving technique. And it, I've come to the realization there's kind of two different schools of thought here. Some guys are really smooth, you know, and it's all about, you know, the feel of the car. And then others drive where they kind of just shutter back and forth left and right on the steering wheel, kind of just taking up the slack. Like if you're drawing, there's some people that make big, long lines, and then there's others that just make little tiny lines. And they still make a perfect circle, but they just do little, little bits. And that's kind of how Mario drove. And man, I was just, I was watching his footwork. I was watching how he held the steering wheel. And it was really cool. It was like watching a master feather that truck around the track. And we weren't racing or anything, but there was so much technique, you know, in the, in the way that he would approach curves and corners and the straightaways and this kind of thing. And it was just really cool to spend time with him and watch that. So that's the story of spending the day with Mario. <laughs> I, I really recommend it if you get a chance. It was really cool. It was really cool. All right, I've got a question for you guys. What is the most important tool in your garage? All right, I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. Come on. Give me, yeah, all right. All right, well, it's probably the one you use the most. And that would be your sockets, your ratchets, your screwdrivers, and your wrenches. And if you want quality tools there, you probably ought to check out somebody like Cornwell. 
Now, granted, you can get some cheaper tools. And honestly, there's a place for those. Those ones that you want to bend up and heat and go into certain places. And those screwdrivers, you don't mind screwing up. <laughs> well, that's where you get the cheap stuff. But if you want real quality tools that are going to last and have a warranty, that's where you need to check out somebody like Cornwell. They've been doing it forever. And believe me, you do get what you pay for. All right, this question comes from Alex. Alex wants to know, how do you buy a used project? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, if you ask your wife, she says, don't. Don't do it. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you what, buying a used project is a challenge. There's a lot of things you need to look for. Back in the day when you used to find a project, you found an old car or an old truck. And it was something that was original and had been parked in a garage or a barn or whatever. But you pulled it out pretty much like it came from the factory, just old and beat up. Well, those days are pretty much gone. You rarely do you find that completely untouched original vehicle. Now it's probably been through two or three hot rodders. And what you're buying is a used project. That can be a real challenge because somebody else has already hacked on this thing. This is what Alex is asking. How do you buy a used project? So let's just start. First of all, you're going to find some parts in there. Obviously, the guy you're getting it from is going to tell you what he thinks has been done to it. But you can only take that so far because it's usually been through two or three hands. Generally, what happens is Somebody tears into a project, they get in over their head, and they sell it to their buddy, who then lets it sit for a couple years. He doesn't want to mess with it, and it gets sold again. Now add two or three times, and now you're looking at it. So, first of all, you got to look th over the vehicle. Is it solid? Is it, you know, the typical things that we've talked about? Is it rusty? Is it something you can repair? Do you have the time and the tools and the ability to be able to repair this thing? Then you need to start assessing the parts, because... A lot of times you'll get a project that a guy will say, well, I want, there's $20,000 worth of parts that come with this car. A friend of mine just approached me recently. He had a car for sale. He'd been working on this thing for 15 years and had $20,000 worth of parts that went with it. And he wanted 10 grand for the whole thing. Well, that sounds like a good deal right off the top. But the thing is, you have to go in there. The stuff that I was looking at, when you start to go through the boxes, all the boxes have been opened. Half the instructions are gone. You don't know what parts are still there and what has been lost. And I'll tell you what, when you start getting into some of these independent front suspension kits that have been laying around in boxes, the boxes are wet and they've fallen apart and people have put parts into plastic bags that are unmarked. Man, you don't know what's there. And there are really important spacers and shims and brackets and stuff that if you don't have that, <laughs> you are screwed if you don't have that. You have to know how to make it yourself. And if you're not at that level, this is not a good thing for you. The best thing that you can do, obviously, if they have good documentation, this is why we keep pushing people to, to get a project planning book, because then they would have a record of what has been done, you know, and what they've done. If they don't have that, though, you're on your own, even with that you still need to go through the boxes and kind of assess what you've got. And it comes down to, just like you would on an original car, you gotta look through it, see if it's repairs that you can make, stuff that is in your wheelhouse of skills, and something that is actually gonna be a project you wanna do, but then it's compounded by the aftermarket parts that they've got. For example, I had a lady the other day uh, get in touch with me. Her husband had passed away, and he was building a cheetah replica back you know in the 80s. And he had a 440 six-pack motor that was going to go in it. And she was wanting to get rid of it. She didn't know anything about it. She just wanted to get rid of everything. I wasn't interested, but I said, send me some a list of the parts that you know of. And he had brand new Predator carburetors in boxes. And as you know, nobody really uses Predator carburetors anymore. They were hot at one time, but now they're just kind of something you hang on the wall. You know, there was no real value to it. And I, I told her, I said, listen, the Cheetah was primarily a Chevrolet car, so... So the real cheetah guy is not really going to want that 446 pack, but there's a lot of Mopar guys that want it. I said, so your best bet is going to be to sell the motor and, and transmission separately to a Mopar guy and sell the car to somebody else. And she was like, well, yeah, I don't want to do that. So she was kind of stuck. And I said, well, you're going to take a shot then because there's people going to kind of, you know, nickel and dime you, pick and choose that kind of thing, which is an unfortunate situation for her. But if you're going to buy something like that, you've got to know it's like if you're going to look at that 
project and go, okay, I want to build this car. And an old kit car is a prime example of this. You know, you have to be able to go, okay, I want this part, but I won't use that. And I know there's a market and I've got a buddy that might want that 440 or that four speed transmission or that rear end. So you can kind of get your money back or kind of keep the project moving. If this is beyond you, run like the wind from that project. It's not for you. I don't care how good of a deal it might look like. If you don't have access to, to moving that thing down the road, or getting it done, this is just a nightmare waiting to jump on you. When you're looking at a used project, make sure you look at it all. And I mean, don't get in a hurry here. If the guy says it's got a crate motor, how long's the motor been sitting? Because if the motor's been sitting for a few years, you know, you don't know what's been done to it, especially if there's been no coverings all over the carburetor or the intake or whatever. You don't know how it's been stored. You don't know. You just don't know. And you have to look at it that way. So look at the parts. Go through everything. If the weather stripping is new in boxes and it's 20 years old, it's not new weather stripping anymore. You're not going to love putting that in, I promise you. So look through the parts. Make sure you get a really good assessment of what you're looking at, and then you'll be able to make a decision on it from there. And you need to be really honest with the guy that's selling it. Because a lot of these guys, you know, they'll watch one of the auction shows or something like that, or they'll go buy the receipts that are there in the box. Well, there's 50 grand worth of stuff, 20 grand, whatever. And you kind of need to school them. And if you're kind about it, most people are open to this. If you look at it and go, yeah, you know, brand new, that was what it was, but see, this is no good anymore, and the, the bearings are bad, or this is shot, and so this is what I'm going to offer you. They'll understand it. Hopefully that helps you, Alex. That's a little dicey situation that takes a little more time to look that over, but hopefully you'll be able to, to, to go through that and get yourself a good deal. All right, I've got a question for you that I got the other day, which comes up a lot, and it has to do with rust and corrosion on a vehicle, because that's pretty much something that everybody's going to run into in one way or another. The guy was asking me, he said, is there ever a time where it's acceptable to leave rust or a rust hole in a vehicle? And that's a really good question, because as a restorer, I hate rust, you know, and the thought of a rusty hole being in a vehicle, I hate that. There are some times where if you treat things right, you don't have to go through a full cutout, weld-in, repatch. So when would those times be? Well, first of all, if you're looking at a floor pan, let's say, and you've just got a few little pin holes here and there, there is no reason to cut that whole floor pan out and replace it, provided the metal is good around it. Now, let me clarify that. When you're talking about a floor pan or a panel will rust in, in a couple different ways. Sometimes it's a uniform coating of rust, so the whole thing gets thin. So then the thinnest parts, you start to see pinholes in. But the rest of the panel is very soft. If you push on it, you can feel that thing moving, so the whole panel is soft. So even though you might only have a couple of pinholes showing, you got a rotten panel. That needs to be replaced always. Another way the panel can rust is that you get just a couple of spots, pinholes here and there, but the rest of the metal is really solid. Sometimes it even still has its paint on it. And why they rust like this, nobody really knows, but sometimes they do. Now, if you have a panel like that, then you can coat those panels with a, a really nice rust prohibitive paint, like a KBS coatings or something like that. You can stop that rust and you don't have to repair or replace that whole panel, provided it's not a structural piece. Now I'm talking like on a floor pan on a unibody car or even a car that has a frame under it. Now, if you're starting to see rust holes in a frame or a structural piece, yeah, you need to get in and repair that. That's eventually gonna fail on you. So you can see it depends on where the rust is, where the damage is gonna be. But if you're talking about a body panel that's gonna have nice paint on it, I don't recommend that you do not fix the rust. In other words, you need to fix it. Because what happens, even if you get the whole thing sealed up and mudded and whatever you're going to do, all it takes is a little pathway for that moisture or that air to get in the back side of that and it will find a way and you're going to bubble up under your nice paint. I've seen it happen and the only way to stop that for sure is to have solid metal underneath there and do your substrates correctly when you put your paint job on. If you're talking a body panel, a fender, a rocker panel, something like that, if you've got rust holes, you need to replace it. But like I said, there are some instances on a floor pan or something like that where if you've got a little pinhole here and there, 
you don't have to repair it. But you have to make sure you're doing the proper techniques to stop that rust. All right, that's it for today. Once again, we're brought to you by Cornwell Tools. Have a great day and get out there and work on something. <laughs>